We're going to be joined by Ken Del Vecchio, our legal analyst, in just a moment. But we do have some breaking news at this hour. Hurricane Iota is apparently just hours away now from striking the coast of Nicaragua and Honduras. Analysts are now expecting the worst, given that the winds there are 175 miles per hour. It is now the second most powerful storm ever recorded in the Atlantic. And again, it is hitting a part of Central America that was just struck just a couple of weeks ago by Hurricane Eta. Hurricane Eta killed hundreds, destroyed thousands of buildings, and now there are fears that the loss of life over the next 24 hours in Central America uh, could simply be off the charts and catastrophic. Uh, Ken Del Vecchio joins us now. Ken, first of all, I know your hearts and prayers go out to everybody in Central America, as do mine. Is there any sort of responsibility, global responsibility, in terms of the cleanup and the assistance that's going to be needed in the next couple of days? Look, this is obviously a tragedy that's about to hit. Hopefully it's overblown. And it's like one of these many other things where the government and media are being hysterical about something and it's not the case. But if this is actually as damaging as it appears to be, no, there is no responsibility globally or by any particular country. That said, those countries that do have the wherewithal, I do believe should help out with humanitarian aid. I do not like, obviously, uh, given my many well-known positions regarding illegal immigration, the thought process that we should be just welcoming in people and in mass into the United States for any specific re for any specific reason, including uh, matters that involve significant uh, detrimental things that happen in our country. Uh, again, I'm going to use the phrase "that said." we do have a moral responsibility to provide some kind of aid. And in some cases, it may be allowing in, allowing in legal immigration, but not in figures that can cause damage to the United States. How about simply the responsibility of, well, let's, you know, let's suppose the policy is we don't want another rush of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people leaving Honduras and Nicaragua and going north through Mexico and trying to come to the United States. Maybe just in terms of if that's the policy, it makes sense to try to help ease the situation as quickly as possible in Nicaragua and Honduras so people don't have the incentive to leave. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm just going to restress. I cannot be in favor of allowing hundreds of thousands, even tens of thousands of people to flee whatever country it is for whatever reason they have to come to the United States because we just do not have the resources, abilities to be able to take care of these people. However, uh, we should provide some type of financial humanitarian aid. Most of it should come from private corporations and individuals in the United States who choose to do that. Secondarily, the government can and should kick in in a reasonable amount uh, while at the same time limiting aid that's unreasonable in many other countries because we provide way too much assistance to too many other countries for reasons that are nowhere near the potential tragedy level of this. So we should start by taking back things that we provide unnecessarily. Like, for example, we've got much too many troops in nations around the world while we're in the process of trying to nation build something that's been going on for decades and decades in the United States, which Donald Trump has been trying to stop and has been eliminating in large degrees. Um, we are talking with uh, Ken Del Vecchio. He's a legal editor for Quick Hits News. And by the way, you can uh, sub sub submit your questions live right now through the HAPS TV app, through, uh, I believe, YouTube, uh, Periscope, Twitter, all the rest, and it'll show up on our little screen. We've already got a hello from Seattle from Peter. We've also got a high five award, uh, Ken, from uh, Pablo and Peter uh, and David Benaim, a Bravo award, which means bravo for you being on the show, I think. Um, Ken, there's uh, other, other big news that came out today. This involves the, um, the coronavirus vaccine. Moderna is now the second company to produce some results that seem promising. Just a few weeks ago, it was Pfizer that said that their, their initial results found that their vaccine 90% effective. Moderna says their vaccine is uh, now 94% effective. It suggests that the vaccines might be ready to roll out perhaps uh, by the spring. Would you take either of these? <laughs> Me personally? I'd have to yeah. give it a lot of I'd have to give it a lot of thought before I would take any vaccine that's new on the market or allow anybody in my family to take it. I'm open minded to it. I think it's great for the nation to have these vaccines available because I believe that there are tens of millions of people who are eagerly awaiting taking the vaccine. That's their right to take it if they want to. 
Uh, if it helps uh, curb the coronavirus, which I'm going to take on face value that the vaccines likely will, then then let's get it out there. And mass, that seems to be Donald Trump's wishes. Donald Trump is very intelligent, as any leader would be in this circumstance, to try to have a vaccine available for people who want to take it. And nobody should try to stop those efforts. I've heard of efforts in particular states that are potentially launching lawsuits to stop trying to have the vaccine come into their states, which seems axiomatic to those states' positions. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. This is only good news. I'm very hopeful that that these vaccines will work. I'm optimistic that they will work. Uh, I believe that Donald Trump has has enacted a great policy with uh, what was it called Operation Warp Speed in getting this vac- in getting vaccines ready. And I believe that no one should stop in the the attempted uh, implementation of them. Again, with the caveat that people should only take them upon their own volition and not have them forced upon them. We have a hello from uh, David in New York. Hello from uh, Pablo in Los Angeles. We have a, looks like a purple something or other who says, who are you people? Well, I'm David Schuster and this is Ken Delvecchio. We're both with, with Quick Hits News and we're broadcasting live over the HAPS app and taking your questions and even reading your comments and Ken to the point about um, the vaccine. Look, I do think that if the vaccine gets rolled out uh, and it's successful, that yes, President Trump deserves some credit for that. However, there's some complaints coming from the Biden transition team uh, that Joe Biden is not being kept in the loop, not being given any briefings about what the Trump administration plan is for the vaccine distribution. Here's what Biden had to say today, and I'll get your reaction. Watch. All right, a, a lot to unpack there. First, Ken, on the idea that the Biden campaign is not a transition, they're not getting briefings in terms of a distribution plan that the Trump administration may have in place. Is that a fair complaint? Ugh, man. I mean, first of all, there's so much fear mongering there. I, I, I think I'm tired of it. I think I think 70 million plus people are tired of it. I'm a little confused about the terminology of the Biden transition team transitioning to what? Uh, Joe Biden right now is not legally the president elect of the United States of America. He's still a candidate. It's 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 fairly arrogant to be considering himself to be transitioning to the presidency. Uh, we do have to, of course, acknowledge that there is some reasonable possibility that Joe Biden may become the president of the United States upon all of these different lawsuits being determined and recounts happening and sifting through all the evidence that's showing voter fraud. I do acknowledge that I don't know whether or not Joe Biden will become president. I think it's looking more and more unlikely every day. And I know we're going to get into that later. Uh, I do think that as we talked about in a previous program, that following some sort of protocol and allowing Biden the opportunity to vet potential people for his cabinet, to have some information, information that is not impugn upon the national security of this country uh, to be provided to Joe Biden. I don't think that Donald Trump at this stage has any obligation whatsoever to be briefing Joe Biden in any matters related to national security. I don't think that. But well, well, well uh, let me stop you right there because uh, I'm going to play for you the soundbite that we've got from Trump's national security advisor, who said that those briefings will start. But in terms of the coronavirus, if the, and, and again, I totally agree with your point. Technically, Joe Biden is not yet the president-elect. That doesn't happen until December 
first of all, until the end of December, and that comes after December the 14th, when the electors from the Electoral College actually meet in their respective states with their sleigh and produce the certificates, which then get delivered to Congress. I believe it's January the 5th, January the 6th, when they formally get presented. And only then is it clear that Joe Biden has the 270 electoral votes. But uh, to, to your point, on the chance that, uh, or on the assumption that, well, he might be the president of the United States, wouldn't it be wise for the sake of the country, for the Trump administration to say, okay, Biden, just in case you are the president, here's what we've put in place so far in terms of rolling out the distribution of these vaccines. I think that Joe Biden is entitled to the amount of information that the general public is and no more at this point. And really? yes, I, I don't think that, that in, I do not think that Joe Biden any more than any other person needs to have any information that's not ordinarily available to the public, just like he wasn't privy to it the day before the election. When this all gets sorted out and it's determined either that Donald Trump will remain president or that Joe Biden will step into the presidency, then at that point, I think there'll be plenty of time for him to be briefed on any matters of national security, and I will be 100% for it. It's not... Well, I my issue is that and I think in terms of something like the supply chain where it may take, look, I don't, I'm not an expert on this stuff. I don't know how long it takes for a, an administration to get up to speed and figure out how to distribute 300 million doses of a, of a vaccine. But on the chance that it does take weeks and weeks and you need to know who's at the Pentagon and what plans have been put in place so far and what's been done with the General Services Administration and who's responsible for the distribution, I don't think there's, there's harm uh, in sharing that information with Joe Biden so we can at least build on that. But I, I get your point. As far as national security, I do want to play for you. Uh, President Trump's national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, here's what he said today about the national security briefings that normally go to a president-elect. Watch. Ken, your reaction to that? Robert O'Brien, the National Security Advisor. I think there's some slippery slopes here that are that are legally based as well. First of all, it's it's not as simple as just advising Joe Biden of something, like talking about the chain of command with, with reference to 300 million doses potentially of vaccines being distributed to people. It, Joe Biden really doesn't need to know that much about the specifics of that at all. He just needs to approve it upon having the the basic information involved in it. The, the, the machinations and mechanisms of how it's distributed, that's going to involve like literally hundreds of people within the Biden administration and thousands upon thousands of people in government and the military to do. And at this stage, we we do not need for Joe Biden to, to be aware of this. And why I'm saying that at this stage, because that gets into my second point, that again, he's not the president-elect of the United States right now. It may take some time to determine who is the president come January 20th, or what I'm trying to lead to, a later date. Just because January 20th <clears throat> is the steadfast, set-in-place date normally, that's the word, normally, for somebody to take take office, it doesn't mean it's going to happen that way this year because this, I'm sorry, next year, because there are so many different cases that are so many different state legislatures that are going to be needing to make tough decisions upon hearing a lot of evidence. It's, it's, it's well within reason that this will get stayed the entirety of the January 20th inauguration of either Donald Trump being quote unquote re-inaugurated or Joe Biden taking the helm. And that means that no matter what, there will be an appropriate time for him to be briefed on all of these issues. 
look, I, I, and let's let's we'll get to the uh, to the election lawsuits in just a sec. But I'm I'm going to respectfully disagree because I I think that uh, again, as far as it, look, it's yeah, it's not Joe Biden who needs to know which particular agency or who's been tasked with what in terms of the distribution. These are people very far down the bureaucratic food chain. But given that the Biden administration is going to be filling a lot of those hundreds of jobs that you mentioned, I don't think it hurts for those people to at least get a general sense in terms of, well, what has the Trump administration already put in place? Because in terms of, you know, if it's booking aircraft or transportation or security or doing checks on all the various companies that may be involved in the distribution, some of that may involve some government resources that may take weeks. And to me, if, it, if that means if briefing those people who would presumably be in a Biden administration means that if Joe Biden is president, it saves a couple of weeks in the distribution. To me, that's that's worth it. But let's talk about uh, the can actual- I, Can I just respond to that briefly? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a point where we agree and a point where we may disagree on this. I think we both agree that there needs to be a reasonable time for Joe Biden, if he becomes president of the United States, to be briefed. And I think that that reasonable amount of time we probably feel is the same amount of time. That said, I think where we're having a disconnect is that I don't think it needs to be now because mm. I think it needs to be at a time period when we know that he is president-elect. So once it's, there's knowledge that he's president-elect, whether it's December 14th or some later date, that's when the time period, the clock will start ticking where him and his staff should be briefed. Now it's way premature. I, look, I, I agree with you. I think I'm willing to say, you know, December 14th, that would give him presumably five weeks. I think if you can't organize a massive distribution of vaccines by, you know, within sort of with by getting debriefed with over a period of five weeks, and then presumably some of these vaccines won't even be ready until February or March, it seems like that's enough runway for the Biden administration, if it is the Biden administration, to get this right. But let's turn to the lawsuits. Here's Sidney Powell, who is one of President Trump's attorneys speaking on Fox News. Watch. Okay, a couple of things there. She's referring to Dominion, which was the voter, essentially, software machine that was used in Georgia. And the allegation goes that Dominion switched votes that were intended for Donald Trump and switched them over to Joe Biden. The problem that I've seen, Ken, is it, never mind that you have people like Andrew McCarthy went on Fox and, and blasted Sidney Powell and say, look, if there's evidence, you need to put it forward now. Putting aside that, the only evidence we have seen has come from the Georgia Secretary of State, who says we have paper replicas of every ballot and in every ballot it shows that the paper reflected what the voters intention was that there was no switching of votes so what exactly is the evidence regarding dominion which also by the way the company says that there was no fraud there was no vote switching what am i <laughs> now you see me now you don't you know what i am i'm millions of donald trump votes that i believe there's an extremely good chance have been heisted via faulty software in Dominion and Smartmatic, which Smartmatic may not be too smart because it appears that they've been caught. I know what your question is. Your question is, what's the evidence? Yeah. Well, I have to tell you this. I've given this a lot of thought. And when I listen to Sidney Powell speak, I listen to somebody who I believe is highly credible. This is not only an attorney. This is an attorney who represents the Donald Trump campaign. She's got more information right now than 99.99999 plus percent of America. And she's talking about having eyewitness testimony right now in the form of uh, sworn affidavits from people who were involved with these companies that can explain how the fraud was perpetrated. She's well, talking about well, how can the affidavits that haven't been introduced in any of the lawsuits, because that's, I think, what a lot of people are confused about, because I think it's something like 20 out of 21 lawsuits have either been withdrawn or bounced. And it would seem like the clock is ticking on trying to introduce this evidence in affidavits if it exists. Right. I mean, they have until December the 8th 
before essentially the cutoff, the safe harbor provision when the electoral votes move forward. I don't think people should be confused, David, because right now this just came out and she's telling us that I wouldn't be talking about this if I didn't have the evidence. I believe her that she's got the evidence. She's talking about having the software. She's talking about having the hardware. She's talking about having eyewitness testimony. She's talking about forensics. She's talking about evidence in every type of sort that we're used to as lawyers improving cases, audio, video. And she's backing it up right now with circumstantial evidence. How, do you, how does one explain that there's in place two-thirds of votes going to Joe Biden one-thirds of votes going to Donald Trump multiple times over. Not just not just that it happened once or twice, but it happened several times in several different states. That's a statistical impossibility. Another statistical impossibility... Well, we'll probably there because the early ballots, nationwide, the polling was people who voted early by two out of three went to Joe Biden, one out of three went to Donald Trump. The people who voted same day as November the 3rd, two out of three went to Donald Trump, one out of three went to Joe Biden. I'm not talking about in generalities, David. I'm talking about in exacts and specifics. It's statistically impossible that you're going to have big, giant batches of two-thirds of votes, literally two-thirds of votes, 66.67 of votes and 33.33% of votes going to Donald Trump over and over and over again. That's an algorithm repeating itself. Just like it makes no sense that there's 98,000 ballots in, in Pennsylvania that are just written out for for Joe Biden. Nobody votes that way. Yeah, a handful of people do, but not 98,000 in Pennsylvania. But that's already been adjudicated. In other states. What's that? Already been adjudica- that's already been adjudicated in Pennsylvania, and the Trump supporters and the Trump team lost the lawsuit. The only lawsuit that they've won in Pennsylvania is one that involves postmarked um, ballots, and that number is, according to the Secretary of State in Pennsylvania, about 10,000. Even if you eliminate all 10,000 from Joe Biden's column, that still leaves him nearly 60,000 votes ahead of Donald Trump. I mean, he's at 68,000 now. He goes down to 58,000. How do you make up the difference of 58,000 when there's been no evidence presented in Pennsylvania to counter any of that? First, nothing has been lost. Just because a case has gone to a lower court and has been decided in either direction does not constitute a loss. Very specifically, not in a case of this magnitude. These cases are going to keep going up the chain. And as I mentioned in previous shows, this is going to all go directly to the Supreme Court. You are correct, no doubt evidentiary wise, if you're trying to piecemeal this together by dead voters and by voters who moved out of state and by voters whose signatures haven't been verified, we're unlikely to make up 58,000 votes. That said, when you take into account that these votes were supposed to, these ballots rather, were supposed to be segregated that came in three day, within three days after election night, 8 p.m. in Pennsylvania, if the votes are were indeed segregated, it's not going to matter all that much in adding into the vote total uh, to for for Donald Trump to overcome it. I believe that they're not that they weren't segregated based on the varied evidences that's out there, and that these votes were mixed in. These ballots, rather, were mixed in with legitimate ballots, and that's going to be another big factor combined with six hundred eighty thousand Republican of six hundred eighty thousand ballots that were that were not watched by Republican poll, uh, poll overseers because the Democrats didn't allow them to. You take those types of things and you add them together, and the Supreme Court might ultimately say, you know what, this, there's so much fishiness here. There's so many different problems here that we're going to order a new election. We're not necessarily going to order an election uh, tally in favor of Donald Trump, but we're going to order a new election. But let me step back to what you originally started with. What Sidney Powell is talking about is a complete game changer. It's not... It's if not it's true, if it's true and if she has the evidence to prove it. But I guess what I'm suggesting is when you have Dominion and Smart, whatever it is, saying it's not true, Sidney Powell, wouldn't the evidence have to be she has to have somebody from inside one of those two companies with the proof that, in fact, there was fraud and there was an algorithm or whatever it was that was changing Biden, that was changing Trump votes to Biden votes. Right. I mean, her just she can be as convincing as we want. But absent the actual evidence from inside the company, I mean, how does this move forward? I, I completely agree with you that the that the most salient and important phrase is if it's true. I happen to believe that it that it's very likely that it is true by the combination of the different evidence that I see out there. That circumstantial evidence is so grave to me. Just going state by state, I named a bunch of the different types of circumstantial evidence. How about that? Ninety percent of the registered voters in Wisconsin voted. You know, and I know 
that that is another near politically impossible statistic. 90% of people in any given state never vote in anything ever. The only time I've ever seen people vote in blocks like that are the Hasidic Jewish communities, which vote in magnanimously high blocks of votes. And, and, and I give them an enormous amount of credit for, for being able to put that together. But nobody else in America votes that way, much less gigantic, much less entire states. So that said, I'm taking that circumstantial evidence and I'm putting it together with what Sidney Powell is saying. And I believe her. I don't believe that an attorney of that level that would put herself out there and say, I have the evidence when I don't. And she's very specifically stated that she's got hard, direct evidence via people who are involved in those companies. And I'll tell you, David, as a final point on, on this, uh, look, after trying over 400 cases myself and being a former judge, a former prosecutor and a, and a defense attorney, uh, guess what? Don't too often believe what defendants say. <laughs> so well, the well, thing, lawsuit, again, there was a lawsuit on this point in Wisconsin. It hasn't gone anywhere. And, and there's a dispute in Wisconsin as to whether the 90 percent is that um, registered voters or eligible voters. And there is a difference. But right now, there's no there's no evidence right now in Wisconsin that's been put forward. But to, to the point, I mean, again, this gets back to the original question, Ken, aside from circ circumstantial evidence, right, that maybe the numbers don't seem to add up or maybe they do according to the Biden campaign. Maybe they don't according to Trump supporters. But doesn't there have to be a certain level of evidence that beyond circumstantial that actually gets presented in one of these federal courts in order for the Trump campaign to have a chance? No. Uh, many cases, even criminal cases, which the, it's the highest standard of proof that there is, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, is proven solely by circumstantial evidence. If you go to bed in an hour from now and you wake up tomorrow morning and there's snow on the ground, but it's not snowing currently, well, the circumstantial evidence shows you that it snowed the night before. So cases certainly can be proved by circumstantial evidence. The circumstantial evidence in these cases, in, in all these different uh, swing states, to me, is palpable. I mean, there's, I, I've named about six or seven types already. How about the factor that different states, like in Georgia, uh, in Fulton County, the uh, Board of Elections personnel told everybody that votes will stop being counted at 1030. Everybody's going home. All the Republican poll watchers went home and then they counted through the night. And then magically, all these votes appeared for Joe Biden. I understand what the counter argument is on how these votes magically appeared for Joe Biden, that well, it was mail-in ballots that were counted, and they're in favor of Joe Biden. Okay. There's also a paper trail behind all these mail-in ballots. So, in other words, there's there's an actual registry from each of these precincts and each of these precinct locations that matches up with these voters, and the voters had to be identified and had to be you know double checked. And again, the Republican Secretary of State in Georgia says that this is this is nonsense. That the vote was legit. That there was no funny business. There was no fraud. And you've got the company Dominion, which was overseeing the machines, saying that there was no vote switching from Trump to Biden. But let's let's put all this aside for a sec. Again, would you would it fair to say that December the eighth, for whatever evidence is out there, circumstantial or hard evidence, if Sidney Powell and the Trump campaign are going to be able to put it forward and actually be effective, they have to do it by December the eighth. Okay. First of all, I'm not even remotely swayed by what the anti-Trump Secretary of State of Georgia has stated it was very easy to manufacture uh, these these types of uh, votes for Joe Biden. W all one needs to do is have a simple chain of fraud of making a list of alleged people who voted and then dump in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of votes into the system uh, through all these different measures and means. Um, that's but there's no evidence to that. There's no evidence to that. There's just numbers that people, some people don't like, but there's actual no evidence that anybody has put forward in Georgia or Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania that shows that there was some mischievous effort, fraudulent effort to dump votes into the system. Nobody's come forward yet. There are the claims, of course, from Sidney Powell and others, but again, we have not seen any affidavits. We have not seen any whistleblowers from any of these companies yet. I, I, I disagree because I keep hearing from numerous people involved in the Trump campaign while they're holding up uh, stacks of affidavits from people that there are literally tens of thousands of affidavits from people speaking to all different kinds of voter fraud and election fraud. And there's numerous different lawsuits that have already been filed that cite those affidavits. So I believe that there is hard evidence by way of witness testimony. And from, again, from what I'm hearing, there's all other kinds of 
direct evidence. But I'm sorry, I, your 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 specific question that you asked was, doesn't this well, have to be the question? And that is, I mean, if there are these affidavits, what is it that the Trump campaign is waiting for? How come only they have seen them? We haven't had any judges at the federal or state level that have seen these affidavits. And secondly, don't they need to produce these affidavits or whatever evidence they have by December the 8th? I don't think it's accurate that that they haven't been seen by the courts. I think that people can go online right now and pull up literally dozens and dozens of complaints with evidence that's that's attached to those complaints via the affidavits, and they can read many of them uh, th themselves, and they can start coming to conclusions. All I'm going to say as, as a direct point on this is that this is all going to be viewed by the courts. Everybody can be rest assured of that, and by the state legislatures. But as to the December 8th date, the answer really is no. I understand that that is a slated normal deadline but we all have to we all have to recognize the court's power to stay the imposition of any certifications you know in some legal terms and it, they can they can enact an injunction or a restraining order they could re actually restrain the state legislatures and the electoral college from certifying these election results pending the outcomes of cases the state legislatures themselves can determine via enactments of law to stay the imposition of any certifications while they're reviewing this evidence. So if I'm the Democrats, I shouldn't start getting too excited by these pending dates because these dates may come and go with absolutely no resolution. As an American, I want to see this get resolved as soon as possible. As an American, though, even more so, I want to see this get resolved in a just manner. And a just manner is reviewing all this evidence. So I totally agree with you on the big if. If it does turn out that all these claims are backed up by the by by both the circumstantial and the hard evidence, which I'm seeing in a pretty steady progression that it is, then Joe Biden is losing this election, and and we're not going to know about that for a while. If it turns out otherwise, then then Joe Biden will become president of the United States, but it might not happen too quickly. 174 live chats. A lot of people saying Ken Del Vecchio is on drugs. Everyone knows it's fraud. <laughs> Somebody else, uh, somebody says, give me a break. Y'all are hanging on to a dead tree. Guy at the top is professional. Good job, man. Stop giving these blank folks time. You know, the fact of the matter, we had somebody said, oh, is this a conservative channel? This is not a conservative channel. This is not a democratic channel. This is a journalistic channel. And for me, I look out at this country and see, okay, 75 million people voted for Joe Biden. 70 million voted for Donald Trump. There are 70 million people out there. I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them feel as Ken Del Vecchio does. And to me... I think that the smart play from the Democrats is you ought to recount every vote. Go back through in every single state, examine every ballot, every vote, make sure that all the courts have a thorough look at this so that at the end of the day, if in fact Joe Biden has won this election, there is no doubt in anybody's mind that the judiciary has found that Joe Biden has won and we can all move on. But to Ken's point, I do believe that there should be scrutiny on all of these claims, on all of these allegations. But there's also going to be some direct evidence, in my view, that actually supports them. Ken, as far as the electoral map, and I've had it up here for a little while. Right now it's at uh, Biden 290, Trump 232. Uh, this is with Georgia not in play. Uh, even if you withdraw Pennsylvania, and again, I said a short time ago, Pennsylvania, they're looking at maybe 10,000 votes that might switch. But even if you with, if you throw Pennsylvania in the Trump column, it still becomes a Joe Biden 270, Donald Trump 268 electoral college. So the Trump campaign would need to pick up somewhere else, either Michigan or Wisconsin or Nevada or Arizona, right? Yeah. Well, first, can I can I just address one point you made that yeah. anybody that says that this is, is a conservative network, then they might be on drugs. Because if you look at all the different people that make up this network, you have a lot of people who are liberal, you have a few conservatives maybe, and you have a lot of people who are straight down the middle. And I'm seeing like both sides of the coin here <laughs> delivered pretty, pretty, pretty hard and fast. So that I think people can rest assured that ain't the case. Uh, I think they can also rest assured that it ain't the case that that there's not going to be enough evidence here. In in my opinion, that's going to swing this uh, electoral college vote because because as you pointed out, okay, let's say that Georgia does go to Donald Trump. Let's say that that Pennsylvania goes to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is still some vote short. So what does he need? He only needs then one of Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Nevada, or Arizona. 
I think it's quite possible he's going to get all of them because as I keep pointing out, if there is this, I'm sorry, I, I don't like using this word systemic because I keep hearing connected to racism, which is which is a farce. So uh, listening to systemic uh, voter fraud kind of sounds farcical to me. So let's just say widespread voter fraud through like one channel. <clears throat> like if this software from Dominion and Smartmatic really has rigged the election, he's going to get probably all of these states and it's going to be over. So I do think that this can be as simple as if something like the Smartmatic and <clears throat> Dominion software doesn't pan out for some reason, Joe Biden may walk into may walk into the office. However, there are other types of mass voter fraud that we're seeing that can cause things that can r- result in a new election. I know you're pointing out about counting the actual ballots, David, and I do think that that is a valid uh, and valiant first step in trying to remediate this. But if you've had you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of votes manufactured via faulty software, changing votes from Trump to Biden, <clears throat> just giving Biden slew, a slew of votes, a recount's not going to do anything. Also, if you've got like tens of thousands, if again, if not hundreds of thousands of phony ballots that were dropped in in the middle of night that have just been mixed in, then a recount's not going to do anything either. And very specifically in Pennsylvania, if those set votes that were supposed to be segregated as Justice Alito ordered were just mixed in, then a recount's not doing anything either. Here's how this is going to be resolved, and I hope everybody follows this example. Uh, if the courts rule that Joe Biden has won this election, Ken Del Vecchio, at the end of this pandemic, is going to buy me like a 40-ounce steak. If the courts rule that Donald Trump deserves a new election or that Joe Biden was not lawfully elected, I'm going to buy Ken Del Vecchio a 40-ounce steak. The fact of the matter is you can have disagreements over the law, you can have disagreements over the evidence, and you can still be friends, you can still get along as Ken Del Vecchio and I do. Ken, one other thing before we go. Um, there's been a lot of uh, suggestions from people at the White House that Donald Trump if, in fact, the courts do rule that Joe Biden is the next president of the United States, at that point, once Joe Biden is certified, Donald Trump will then say, I'm running in 2024. Um, to me, this is a brilliant political move because I think he then freezes Tom Cotton, Nikki Haley, Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence from, from running. It also keeps Donald Trump relevant for another several years, and he gets to sort of be the, the loud voice in the room that everybody's going to be, be paying attention to. So, in my view, smart politics for him to say that he's going to run in 2024, but for you, in terms of uh, somebody who's a strong supporter of the Republican Party, is it good for the Republican Party if Donald Trump has lost this election for Donald Trump to say so quickly, yes, he is a candidate for 2024, or should Donald Trump at that point step back? Well, I think that Donald Trump will refrain from making such a proclamation unless and until Joe Biden is actually sworn into the office of the presidency. And if at that time, if at if such a time does occur where Joe Biden is sworn in, I actually think it's not only great politics uh, for Donald Trump, I think it's great for the United States because I believe that Donald Trump has been a fantastic president. I believe that most, the vast majority of Republicans, not, not Republicans who are involved in the bureaucracy, not Republicans who are uh, part of the government, they're probably in like two thirds in favor of Trump, one third and not. There's a lot of backstabbing within the party against Trump. Maybe it's 25% of, you know, the 0.000001% of Republicans, meaning the people in government. But the 99.999 plus percent of Republicans, meaning just the regular people like me, like we love Donald Trump. We think he's the greatest thing. Have you ever seen a million person march for another candidate at the end of an election? No. Did you see one for Hillary Clinton? No. I didn't see one for Donald Trump. I saw, but by according to the park police that I know, okay, maybe they had 100,000. Maybe it wasn't wasn't a million. But look, 100,000 is still, I suppose, impressive for a losing candidate to have that many people show up in Washington, D.C. I'll give you that. For a candidate <laughs> who is not lost, who is likely to still win. <laughs> Ken, this is uh, this is great. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, debating you and, and chatting with you. And again, folks, I'm telling you, if Ken and I can have these sort of you know heated discussions and still be friends and still have civil discourse, and we agree actually in most things in life, it's just sometimes in things in politics and maybe economics and, and other stuff where we have our disagreements, we air them out. And then we go out and have a drink and have a steak, which we will do when the pandemic is over. Ken is part of Quick Hits. He's a legal editor. You can, by the way, always catch a Quick Hits, our published show from the journalist comes out each day about five o'clock Eastern time. Go to quickhitsnews.com. You can sign up on our YouTube page for the inbox delivery. Uh, Ken, I'll give you the last word on all of this on anything you want to say about anything we've covered, whether it's the hurricane, Joe Biden's transition, the Trump lawsuits, Trump 24, you get the last word. 
really, I just want to echo what you, my friend, has stated that we're in really crazy times right now, really hysterical times. And to be adding flames to the fire right now, each flame that's added is almost like a stick of dynamite. To have logical, rational discussions, work through the policy together, and try to ultimately seek just results as a group, that is what we need to do. And I think that's what Quick Hits News is trying to do. And I hope that America turns the page in this kind of direction. On behalf of Kendall Vecchio, I'm David Schuster. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We appreciate it. Have a good night.